Mary Queen of Scots spent more time in an English prison than she did in any other phase of her life. Most people don't realise that. Now, when Mary left Scotland, she didn't intend to spend 19 years imprisoned in England. So at what point did she realise that that's where she was? If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. From time to time I cross the border in English territory to tell you stories about Scots. I'm pretty confident that I'm coming back, otherwise I wouldn't go. When Mary Queen of Scots left Scotland, she was every bit as confident of a return as I am. And yet, I want to take you some of the places that she found herself as the gradual realisation dawned that her status had changed from asylum seeker to detainee. On the 15th of May 1568, that 25 year old asylum seeker landed on a small boat on the English coast about 30 miles in that direction. Now, we're all familiar with asylum seekers and you know what happens to them. They get free accommodation and they're treated like royalty. And people ask, why have they claimed asylum in England when they could have done so in France? I suppose nothing's changed. So why on earth did Mary expect help here? Her half-brother, James Earl of Murray, had just defeated her in battle not long after she'd escaped from his prison on an island castle in Loch Leven. While she was in that island prison, Elizabeth of England had promised her support. The sister queens had even exchanged rings as a token of commitment. Of course, Elizabeth would offer a raid now, wouldn't she? And so she arrived up the River Derwent. She was warmly welcomed at Workington Hall where the local gentry were so honoured that they saw through the bedraggled refugee to the Queen of Scots underneath. That night, she wrote a letter to Elizabeth and the next day, her excited hosts escorted her seven miles east to Cockermouth Hall, where everyone turned out in their Sunday best to greet her. And she was introduced to the governor of Carlisle Castle and he most graciously offered an escort of 400 horse for Mary's protection to bring her here. And having arrived as a fugitive two days earlier, she must have felt honoured to be accorded this level of recognition they'd so freely given. What she hadn't recognised is that her freedom had just been taken away and she would never get it back for the rest of her life. We know that now, but her realisation would come later. The Warden's Tower here, which is now demolished, would gain the name Queen Mary's Tower, as it would be the home of this celebrity royal for the next two months. She held court, including meeting the Duke of Norfolk, one of the richest men in England, who would remain part of her story for some time. She wrote home to one of her supporters that she'd been right well received and honourably accompanied and treated. I expect to be back in Scotland on or about the 15th of August with either an English or French army. Mary expected to be riding home at the head of an army within three months. She had no idea of the disappointments ahead. Mary's first disappointment was when she asked to meet with Elizabeth. She was told that that wouldn't be possible until she'd cleared the name of her husband's murder. Now, fortunately, that was a relatively easy hurdle to surmount. But when Elizabeth's representatives revealed that it was to be a much bigger hurdle and Elizabeth had no intention of meeting her in the short term, Mary burst into tears and demanded that arrangements be made for her to go to France. Support to her sister Queen was an easy thing for Elizabeth to pledge when that sister Queen was firmly locked up in Loch Leven Castle. When she was on English soil in Carlisle Castle, that promise proved to have been built on shifting sands. French soil 
would be more stable. Rather than make arrangements for Mary to travel to France, the governor began repair the fortifications and strengthening of the defences and accommodation for an extra hundred troops from Berwick. If Mary didn't realise quite how difficult her situation was, it may be because Elizabeth had given instructions to treat her honourably, but make sure she doesn't escape. So, Mary was allowed to hang her cloth estate in her chambers to indicate her regal position. She could go riding with supervision. The stretch of land outside the castle was known as Ladies' Walk from the time that Mary would promenade. Of course, Carlisle was so close to the Scottish border that even as the civil war there raged between those who supported Mary and those who supported her brother, people loyal to Mary would cross to join her retinue. They tell me that she set off a game of football outside by throwing a ball down to her retinue that had been divided into two teams, 10 French on one side and 10 Scots on the other. So the first ever recorded international football match was played between Scotland and France in England here at Carlisle Castle. If you've got a different suggestion, then let me know in the comments section. Over the next two months, they decided to move Mary further from the Scottish border. She wasn't happy. On the 5th of July, Mary wrote to Elizabeth saying, permit me, if you please, to depart hence without any delay anywhere so that it's out of this country. Since I came of my own free will, I may depart with yours. Our destination, no longer France, but anywhere. But Elizabeth wasn't letting Mary go anywhere, anytime. She did leave here on the 13th of July, 1568, along with four carriages, 20 pack horses, and 23 riding horses. Bolton Castle here in Wensleydale was described by one of Mary's captors as very strong, very fair and very stately with the highest walls ever seen and just one entrance so it could be protected by half the number of soldiers they needed at Carlisle. Mary could walk the boundaries of the castle should she wish, she could even go hunting. Better still, on the 25th of July, Mary got news via a messenger from Elizabeth in London, suggesting that Elizabeth would help Mary regain her Scottish throne. Mary was delighted and immediately wrote back to Elizabeth, telling her that she would stand down the French and Spanish troops that had been mustering to come to her aid. Elizabeth's promises were verbal, Mary's were in writing. Now, there's a tale of Mary escaping Bolton Castle here by being lowered from one of the windows on a horse. She then galloped away into the night. This place is called Queen's Gap or Leyburn Shawl. It's a popular walk that I'm told got its name from our Queen of Scots. It's a lovely peaceful walk for locals, but for me, it seems like a sad place. During her flight, Mary dropped her shawl and it was this that allowed her pursuers to track and capture her. At least that's the local story. But in his book, Mary Queen of Scots, The Captive Queen in England, which has been a great help to me in making this video, it has to be said, David Templeman asks why Mary would have gone to the bother of escaping, given that things seemed to be going so well. She was getting on with her supervisors and she was even learning to speak and read English. She wrote to the Queen of Spain, saying, I believe I have gained the hearts of a great many good people of this country since my coming, so that they're ready to hazard all they possess for me and my cause. In one letter to Elizabeth, she did emphasise the point that when she'd been in prison in Loch Leven, Elizabeth herself had promised to support her cause. Now that she'd placed herself entirely in Elizabeth's hands, Elizabeth could surely do no less.
And so the carrot was dangled for Mary. Look, let's have a commission to look into the whole murder and your husband thing. Did I mention that? Anyway, if that commission proves your innocence, then hey presto. If there was no taint of murder on Mary's part, then the two queens could meet and Elizabeth could support Mary's cause. But Elizabeth had already told Mary's half-brother and Scottish nemesis James Earl of Murray that she had no intention of restoring Mary to the Scottish throne. Mary didn't realise that she'd already been judged and was facing life in prison. The conference trial started on the 4th of October at York. Now, Mary wasn't allowed to go herself, but she was relatively relaxed, cooped up here in Bolton Castle, partly because the guy chairing the commission was the Duke of Norfolk. Remember the guy that had met Mary at Carlisle? Oh, and he'd also secretly agreed to marry her, although he denied that later. The point is, that she didn't get to go herself, but she sent representatives on her behalf. Her accusers? Oh yeah, they got to go. And with them, they took a bunch of letters, which had been conveniently found in a casket, and have conveniently been called the casket letters. Is jiggery pokery a Scottish word, or do folks elsewhere use it? I'm not entirely sure. In case you don't know, jiggery pokery is like, well, it's jiggery pokery. Let's say somebody turned up at court with a set of letters and some poems that they said had been found in a casket under a bed. The letters were supposedly written by a Scottish queen to the guy who she'd married after he'd murdered her husband. Of course, there were inconsistencies and errors in the letters, names omitted, authors placed in one town when multiple witnesses knew she was somewhere else at the time. The people who confirmed that it was the Queen's handwriting were the very people who were accused of her. The defence team weren't allowed to see the evidence and after the letters had been copied, the originals disappeared. But trust me, she's a wrong one. You'd think there had been some jiggery-pokery. Some of the English folks involved with the hearing could see that there'd been jiggery-pokery. One of Elizabeth's men even said, I see not how Her Majesty can with honour and safety to herself detain this Queen, unless she shall be utterly disgraced to the world. What Elizabeth did next was utterly disgraceful. Elizabeth's commission was broken up with no decision, but she did decide to give Mary's accusers another go. This time, the commission would be moved to Westminster. It would be much more a murder trial, and the Earl of Murray and his cohort were told to focus on the idea that Mary had murdered her husband. The problem was, there was a good chance it had been her very accusers who'd done the murder in the first place. Is this the bit where I say that the murder weapon had been a purple curly whirly? No, get on with it. The point is that the Earl of Morton, one of Mary's accusers, was later himself executed by James VI for his part in the murder. No! So on the 7th of January 1559, the Westminster trial started and Elizabeth suggested that Mary resign the Scottish crown to her son James and live a private and peaceful life in England. Mary said, I'm resolved to rather die a queen than live as a private person. I don't blame her. I wouldn't want to live in England either. Although this is nice. Three days later, eight months after Mary had come to England seeking refuge from her pursuers, who'd probably themselves been behind her husband's murder, Elizabeth broke up the conference and it was decided that no fault could be proved on either side. So Mary's accusers, 
who were not found to be at fault were sent home after a private audience with Elizabeth, a farewell reception and a cash gift which in today's terms approaches a million pounds. And Mary, likewise, having been found not to be at fault, who'd agreed to the conference in order to get a private audience with Elizabeth, she was imprisoned for the rest of her life. In fact, Elizabeth had already decided the month before that Mary would be moved further south to be delivered into the custody of the Earl of Shrewsbury. When Mary found out, that's when she realised she was in an English prison. Now, I'm heading south to make a video about the last time that she had an opportunity to escape. Depending on when you're watching this particular video, either that one or another one about the life of Mary will come up on screen now. In the meantime, Hamian Dochus can be a lama alive. Cheerio and Rasta.